Does hope make a difference? <laughs> hope makes all the difference, doesn't it? I was thinking about like, what would be a good illustration of, of, of hopelessness or, or people holding on to hope in a hopeless situation? And I'm sure it's, it's heavily overused, but I couldn't help but think of the Titanic, right? This supposedly indestructible vessel that went sailing across and, and uh, ran into an iceberg. And um, what was it that caused those 705 passengers who were rescued to bother getting off of the sinking Titanic and into an inflatable lifeboat in the middle of an icy ocean? Like, wasn't that just kind of prolonging the inevitable? Like, it did, still seems like a pretty hopeless situation to me. What caused them to do it and what allowed them to be rescued was hope. Their hope that uh, the captain's call to a nearby ship had been heard and that that ship was going to come and try to rescue them. And so out of sight, out of, they could, nothing they could see or touch, just something that they believed out of hope they got into those boats and 705 or 6, depending on which account you read, uh, of those passengers were rescued. Hope. Hope made all the difference. They didn't have hope. They wouldn't have bothered. They would have just gone down with the ship. Well, we know that in Ephesians 2, Paul describes life without Christ as a life without hope, similar to being on that sinking Titanic without a lifeboat, without anybody coming to rescue, just going full bore and waiting to sink. But what we find here in Thessalonians and what we know and believe to be true as followers of Jesus is that the hope of the gospel is the promise of eternal life. The hope of the gospel is the promise of eternal life. That's the hope that causes us to get into that life raft. The hope of eternal life. So as we continue on here in Paul's first letter to the Thessalonians, the thing that allows us to keep our eye on the prize, the thing that makes it possible for us to live out the gospel in these troubling times is knowing that Jesus has promised eternal life to those who trust in him. The, the Thessalonians, uh, remember, had had their teaching with Paul, their teaching time, their discipleship interrupted, and so they were falling short in a couple of areas that Timothy discovered when he went to visit them. They were starting to lose hope because they didn't completely understand how things worked in God's kingdom plan. Paul evidently had taught them that Jesus was coming back to take the believers to be with him. But now some time, some months uh, had passed. And during those months, inevitably, some of their church, some people from their church had died. And they weren't sure how to handle that. What would happen to them? Right? They were, if they weren't going to be alive when Jesus came back, what would happen to them? They wouldn't be around when Jesus returned had they trusted in him for nothing. And you can see where that spiral would quickly take you to, what about me? What if I die before Jesus comes back? And you can see how that complete hopelessness was lurking just right on the horizon for them. Paul wrote to remind them that the hope of the gospel is the promise of eternal life, not just for the living, but also for the dead. He reminded them of the basis of our hope. He reminded them of the assurances that come along with hope and of our appropriate response to hope. And so those are the things we're going to look at this morning. We'll start with the basis right? The basis of our hope, which is Jesus' resurrection. 
Look at verse 13. Hope you got your Bible open. If you don't, slap yourself on the hand and open it back up. Verse 13 says, But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. Now, the word asleep there was Paul's way of referring to those who had died. And, and he used that to help them understand that this was temporary, that they were gone, but they would one day wake up or come back to life, be raised to life again. Similar to the same way that Jesus referred to Lazarus. If you remember in John 11, he said, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go to awaken him. And we know there that Lazarus was dead and Jesus was going to raise him back to life. Paul's using the same analogy here. Now, quick note, there are those who will teach that this means our souls will be in a state of sleep from the time we die until the time Jesus comes back. But there's plenty of other evidence in scripture that indicates our soul goes directly to be in the presence of God while we wait for the resurrection of our bodies. Okay, so Paul says, uh, <clears throat> verse 13, we, don't want you, uh, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who are asleep that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. So Paul was saying here, hope changes everything, right? Hope changes everything everything. And hope for Paul was a joyful and confident expression of eternal life through Jesus Christ. A joyful and confident expression of eternal life through Jesus Christ. That hope changes everything. Look at verse 14. He says, uh, the beginning of it, for since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and in that short phrase, Paul conveys the vital truth of our faith that does change everything. If he had stopped, if he had just said, for we know, we believe that Jesus died, that would be incomplete, wouldn't it? Would be incomplete. There would, we would be still lacking in hope. It would still be super amazing that Jesus made that sacrifice for us, that he allowed his body to be broken right? But without the resurrection, it would be incomplete and there would be no hope. Imagine how the first disciples felt watching this man in whom they had placed all their hopes, all their dreams, and they watched him be beaten and scorned and brutally killed on a cross and watched his dead body laid in a grave. Imagine what that felt like, right? That's the purpose of these days between when we, when we remember his death and when we remember his resurrection. But then, imagine how everything changed three days later when they saw him alive again completely changed. That changed everything. And so the phrase, we believe that Jesus died and rose again, is the basis for our hope. Well, what does this do for us? Paul goes on to say in the second half of verse 14, even so through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep, right? Those who have died in him. Because Jesus rose again, defeating death once and for all, we now have the hope of eternal life and not even a physical death, which is only temporary for us, can take that away. He goes on in verse 15 and says, For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep, right? So there's no distinct advantage to still being alive when Jesus comes back because the dead in Christ will rise and 
not except for, but and those who are alive then will also join him. Paul promised hope for both. Both for those who had died trusting in Jesus and for those who continue to live trusting in him until he returns. And so the basis of our hope is the resurrection of Jesus. The Thessalonians were apparently very concerned about what also would happen at the end of time. Paul spent quite a bit of time in both of his letters to them, trying to straighten them out. And so Paul also made here some assurances about the hope that we have in Jesus. What happens at the end? And I'm going to give credit here to uh, John Stott, who so beautifully put these points into four easy-to-remember R words. The first assurance we have is the return. The return. Jesus is coming back. Take you to the bank. Verse 16. For the Lord himself would descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, with the sound of a trumpet of God. Now there are lots of different opinions about the what and the how of Jesus' return. And that is a great discussion for a different day. What's important here is the fact of Jesus' return. He is coming back. Right? He may not have said it quite as cool as Arnold Schwarzenegger did. But we know it to be true. And that is the basis and it's an assurance of our hope. The second R word is the resurrection. Those who have died in Christ will be raised to life. And now again, there are lots of different theories about how this will work. What will it look like? When will it happen? I had a bizarre off the wall thought this week. Like, what about people who donate their organs? How does that work? And then I thought, I don't know, but I know somebody who does. We don't have all the answers to those questions. And it's fun to discuss it and think about it sometimes. But guess what? God will sort it all out. What matters to Paul, uh, what matters to us is Paul's assurance in verse 16, the dead in Christ will rise first. Right? He's repeating it. The same thing he already said in 14. The dead in Christ will rise first. The great source of hope here is that our death is only temporary. And as Paul emphatically declares in Romans 8, not even death itself can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. There is hope in the resurrection of those who die in Christ. The third R word is the rapture. The rapture. Those who are still alive in Christ will be caught up together with them. Verse 17. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together uh, with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Will this happen before the tribulation? Will it happen after the tribulation? Will it happen somewhere in the middle of the tribulation? Don't care. Okay, that's not entirely true. I do care. But again, these are important conversations to have, but not today. Let me do say this much about it. We should always live like Jesus is coming back today. We should always live like Jesus is coming back today. But we should be prepared to endure any kind of trial or tribulation that we probably, so there's my doctrine sneaking in, that we probably will face before Jesus returns. But what matters with regard to hope is that everyone who is alive in Christ will be caught up. Uh, that word means to be seized suddenly. Right? And we have lots of 
the interesting pictures from books and movies of what that's going to look like. It'll be fun to see it. We're going to be caught up. We're going to be seized suddenly to meet our Savior when He returns. And so there is hope in the rapture of those who are still living when Jesus returns. And then our fourth R is the reunion. The reunion. We will be together with Jesus in an everlasting fellowship. Now, I know for some people, depending on the level of crazy and dysfunction that goes on in your family, the idea of a reunion may have negative connotations. But not this one. This is the greatest reunion of all time. Verse the second half of verse 17, so we will always be with the Lord. We will always be with the Lord. Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 15, if for only in this life we have hope in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. Followed by one of the greatest words in all of Scripture, but, right? But Christ did rise from the dead. He is coming back for us. We will be with him after this life is over into eternity. This is the greatest assurance of our hope that we will one day be reunited with our loved ones who have trusted in Christ for salvation. But most importantly, we will be united with Jesus and be with him forever. There is hope in the reunion with Jesus and with other believers. So all those assurances of hope, right? There's hope in Jesus' return. There's hope in the resurrection of the dead. There's hope in uh, the rapture of the living. There is hope in that great reunion with Jesus and other believers. Well, then how do we respond? How does hope, what hope difference does hope make in our lives. Paul gives us some ideas here, but first and foremost uh, important is trust Jesus. Right? Put your faith in him. Believe in him. If you've never done that before, I ask today, what are you waiting for? Right? What are you waiting for? Come and find me. Find Pastor Chris. Find one of our deacons. Find anyone who's sitting next to you and just let them know. I want to give my life to Jesus. I want to trust him. I believe that he died to pay the penalty for my sins and that if I believe in him and trust in him that I will live again with him someday. Trust in Jesus. Second, Paul tells us we go all the way back up to the beginning of the passage, verse 13. Um, be informed, right? Be informed, Paul said. We don't want you to be uninformed about these things. What we believe is important. What we believe affects the way that we live. And so we do want to understand and know what the Bible tells us about these things because we can. We have it right there for us. And since we're reading it, prayerfully every day as part of the mission of our church, we should be learning from it and growing in it and understanding more and more as we go. That's part of what the Holy Spirit does for us. So be informed. Continue to study. Right? Even about some of these end time things like form an opinion. Discuss it with other people maybe who disagree with you. But at the end of the day, hug each other and, and go on with your life, right? And we'll see. I, I always said, when we get to heaven, uh, there are certain issues that uh, uh, Jesus is going to let us know who was right and who was wrong. And for about a half of a millisecond, we'll look and, and, and maybe think, oh, I was right. And then we're going to go on with eternity. And <laughs> it won't matter. So it's important to think, it's important to study, it's important to be informed, but not important enough to divide us. Third response to hope, grieve differently. 
that's the second half of verse 13 that Paul instructs us. He says, um, I don't want you to be uninformed about those who are asleep so that you may not grieve as others do who are without hope. Right? He doesn't say don't grieve. Right? We grieve. We took some time a few weeks ago to grieve the loss of our brother Eric. Uh, and, a, and a couple of months before that, we, we grieved the loss of our brother Lloyd. It made us sad because we knew we weren't going to see them again in this life. But it's different knowing we're going to see them again. We will have that great reunion because they're going to be resurrected and we're going to be either resurrected or raptured, depending on when Jesus comes back. So we grieve differently than those who have no hope. And I think another part of that is to help those who are grieving to understand grief. And then fourth, encourage others. And for this, we jump down to the last verse, verse 18. Therefore, Paul says, encourage one another with these words. Hope, words of hope are encouraging, right? Words of hope bolster us, they, they, they lift us up, they, they pull us out of discouragement and depression. They help us to get onto the life raft, right? So if you know the people who haven't put their trust in Christ, who are living without hope in this world, bring these words of hope and get them on the raft. Help them to put their hope in Jesus because the hope of the gospel is the promise of eternal life. Musicians, why don't you come on up? Sometimes, sometimes this life feels like those last moments of the Titanic. Right? Cruising along, everything's great. All of a sudden we hit the iceberg. Our hull is split and filling with water and we're destined to sink to the bottom of an icy ocean. But for all of us who have trusted in Christ, to all of us who have believed in the power of His death and the power of His resurrection to defeat sin and death, the hope of the gospel is the promise of eternal.